Good morning. I'm Ian Corzine, your social media lawyer, coming to you live from Key West, Florida. Today, we're going to talk about five tips to instantly up your YouTube game. I've been spending, I think I spent probably last two weeks kind of going over these concepts so that not only could I, but also the creators I work with on a day-to-day -day basis when I do my legal consults could also up their YouTube game. And they're very simple. They don't necessarily have to deal with uh, legal concepts. It's more about attention. It's more about engagement. So I just so glad you're here today. Uh, I'm so glad I'm actually here today. Uh, it was kind of a, a long time to get here. Uh, but I uh, have some business meetings and things like that that are going on, so I'm really excited to be here. And I'm also excited to be able to join uh, you guys today. I got full creativity. Hello, welcome. Thank you so much for coming today. Let me get my uh, screen share on so we can check this out. Uh, where's the Chrome tab? Let's see, here we go. Share that. All right, so we got that share. Are we on there? Okay, great. Awesome. So what I wanted to first start talking about was this concept, which I call interest inception. The bottom line is, is that when you're trying to make content that communicates something, whether it's to persuade, to entertain, there has to be an interest inception. Um, before you do anything, before you want to give back, before you want to help people, before you want to persuade people, before you want to teach people, you have to get their interest. And what's so difficult these days is getting people's interest because, you know, there's so much going on in this world. There's so much going on in social media. There's so many different things that people could be doing right here and now that uh, you need to be able to lock in, kind of hack in to their attention so that, you know, you can get their attention to be able to get the, the good stuff that you're delivering. So what I, I what I term it is called interest inception. And we're going to go into three different points about interest inception. Um, first, I also want to say hi to uh, uh, to Mr. Vigia there, censored, censored to be in Corzine. YouTube hasn't been YouTube in a very long time. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. A lot of people are moving to the Rumble platform right now because they feel like there's less censorship there. There's also the ability to get paid uh, for views there. Not quite the same level of AdSense on YouTube and Google, uh, but some amount. We've got Devo here. Welcome welcome to the program, Devo. I'm feeling good. I got a little bit of, <clears throat> my voice is a little bit scratchy from doing the travel, uh, but I feel great and I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, so anyway, so I'm gonna go back to, <clears throat> excuse me, go back to what I was talking about here. Oh, that just uh, interest inception. All right. So this is my, my first, my first point. And that is <clears throat> before you ever seek to do a TikTok channel, a YouTube channel, a LinkedIn channel, you've got to figure out something that is going to really instantly attract people to spend time with you. You know, if you know people, if they're your friends, their family, they're going to go with you. They're going to listen to you. Uh, and they'll go for, for a little bit until it starts to get boring. Now, when, you're, when people don't know you, then it's a real big deal because at that point in time, you really, really do not have their attention and you've got to get it. You've got to somehow figure out a way to perk them up uh, to, in, in my opinion, what I'm going to say in a, in a few moments, make them say, wow, wow, I'm really excited about this content. So that's, that's the first step. Okay. We got um, Janet Wilpen. Good to see you. Hello from Maine. Welcome this morning. So glad you're here today. It's awesome. Um, so interest inception, that's the first tip that I want to talk about causing people to stop what they're doing and watch your content. Now, <clears throat> there are three different types, in my opinion, of interest inception that work on social media platforms. And the first one I call, wow, any kind of content that you see out there where there's big open eyes, uh, people are smiling. They're just so surprised. That's wow type content. And wow content is really, I, I was trying to do kind of my own informal survey and I, and I found that wow content, you know, dominates the social media platforms right now. Most, most, of the, most of the stuff you see that's getting all the views is wow content. So that's pranks, that's challenges, that's little clips where there's something crazy going on. There's an alligator. We're in, we're in Florida now, so hopefully I'll get to see an alligator. Maybe I'll make it a clip and it'll be a wow clip. Uh, those type of things attract the attention uh, of people. There's other other examples of it I have here um, are, you know, cool new products. Tech is wow type content. Um, 
uh, like I said, stunts, someone arrested. I have that. I have personal and unfair, meaning that something happened to someone and you start to know them and it's unfair. Um, we also have a get rich quick. That's a very common interest inception. In other words, you're talking, you know, maybe you're talking to people about Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency and you're encouraging them either to get involved or maybe not. That is kind of wow content. Um, we also have a lot of exposure type content where people expose other people and that's wow. Oh my gosh, that guy really did that, that type of content. Uh, the other one is I wish I had that. Big, big content right now on social media platforms are house tours. And I think I was trying to think about it. And I think really what it, the reason why people watch that type of content is because you're like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. Wow. I wish I had that. Uh, debates are also very popular type of wow content. You're like, you don't even know sometimes who's debating, but you're really uh, emotionally engaged in the anger that's going, that's being exchanged between the people. Uh, we also have behind the scenes. Behind the scenes is wow content. In other words, we're we're watching Marquez Brownlee's latest video, and he's putting the behind the scenes of this video. And you're like, wow, I didn't know it took all that to make that type of video. So those are examples of what I call the wow interest inception. And that's something that you need to strive for if you're starting to get viewers, you're trying to build up your social media pre presence, because with all due respect, most people don't care about you personally. They don't know you. And so you've got to do something. There's got to be an exchange of value going on. And one way you can do that is go, wow, or you can point out some sort of subject that's, wow, oh, wow, I got to see this. Uh, Michael's here. Good to see you, Michael. Uh, so that's the, that's the first type of interest inception type content. The next one is one that I've actually used myself in a lot of my social media uh, posts is, and I don't mean to sound pejorative on this, but it's fear. It's fear type content. It's like, oh my gosh, if you don't do this, you're going to lose your YouTube channel. If you don't you know, invest this way, you're going to lose your money. It's fear type content. And that is very triggering. That causes people to listen up and go, oh, what's really going on here? So that type of content is very popular. You'll see that all over the place. The other type of fear content that I see is confirmation of anger. Someone does something wrong and that's the, the content that's on the thumbnail. And then what ends up happening is you see that and you're like, oh my gosh, that guy is an idiot. I can't believe he did that. And that is kind of a, almost a community type function for uh, for getting someone's attention. It's like, oh my gosh, all these people don't like this guy. We can be unified to not like this guy. So those are the two types of fear content that again, will get the attention of your audience. And then the final one I have here is inspiration. That I, I believe that there's really three to four different types of content that can get someone's attention. And inspirational content definitely gets people's attention. The one thing I will say this is that with the other type of content, you can actually delay it a little bit. In other words, if it's a crazy scene from, uh, you know, you have, uh, like I said, an alligator, an alligator's coming up out of the water, you can actually delay that and people will wait for that because they really want to see that that one scene. However, with inspirational content, you have to get to the heart of the matter quickly. Uh, otherwise you're going to have a problem, you know, getting people's attention. So that's why you see a lot of inspirational content, content have text on graphics, uh, because that's the first thing you see and it's inspiring you to, you know, to go on that diet or, or hit the day, uh, running. So that type of content again is the, is the third type of interest inception content. And then I think the fourth, and I didn't put it in here because it's largely intent based, but how to content can get the attention of people. Most of the time though, the how to content is stuff that people search for. They just want to know how to use an Apple computer. They just want to know how to use YouTube. So they actually search it out. So I didn't include that as something that really, you know, triggers people because most of the time they're looking for it with wow, fear and inspirational content. They're not always looking for it. Matter of fact, that's usually the, the trigger is they see that you're doing that type of content and then they get interested. So those are the three types of that type of content that I have here. Um, and then I, I just do want to say hi, the Sim Architects here. Good to see you. We got Spock rising. Greetings from North Carolina. Good to see you. Oh my gosh, my, I'm blown out here. Let me see if I can turn it up here. Let's see, is that better? Yeah, it's a little bit better. I'm, I'm darker, but a little bit better. Uh, good to see you, Spock Rising. Awesome. Uh, Ignorant Boxing. Hello. Where are you from, Ignorant Boxing? <laughs> uh, all right. So we also have, let's see, anyone else here? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry to come in. We got Matt's here. Good to see you, Matt. 
Good morning from New York. Good morning. Good morning to you. Um, awesome. Matt Tra Keto in wrestling. Nice. Cool. So anyway, so those are the, the those are the, the, like I said, the three different types of interest inception type of content. Let me put this back on the screen here. Uh, let's see. There we go. Uh, and we'll go through it. It's the wow. It's the fear and it's the inspiration. One thing I think is always a problem uh, for people who's getting started on YouTube or any of the other social media platforms is they're not told upfront uh, about the interest inception. In other words, before you want to do any good in this world and you want to get someone's attention, you have to have their interest. So that's why we really focus some time on the wow, the fear, and the inspiration. They tell you how to make the videos. They tell you to be authentic. They tell you how to do the SEO. They tell you maybe a, a, a standard type of script that will keep people engaged, but they don't tell you how to get their initial uh, attention. And I will say that having done this for a little bit of time, it's not about the SEO. It's really about getting the attention and then keeping that engagement. So two different steps, interest inception, and the next one is called engagement mechanisms really focus your time. I would say 80% of your time on the interest inception. That's the most important part of it. But then the second step, after you think that you have something that is going to be interesting, it's going to be wow type content, fear or inspirational, you move on to the engagement mechanisms. And I think that there are three components of engagement mechanisms. Let me just define it for a moment. Engagement mechanisms are things that you do to keep people engaged once they've the interest inception has happened. Once they've clicked on the video, once they've clicked on the post, uh, once they've started listening to the podcast. And then, then there's three different things you can do to engage them through the length of your content. So the first one I have is relatability. And that one is something that a lot of us don't have control over because really all, all we really want to do is show up and be ourselves, which is always a nebulous term, but show up and just try to lay it all on the line, let everyone know what's going on with you, uh, not try to uh, have your ego come out, not try to be defensive, um, just relax as possible when you're sitting in front of a camera on the balcony <laughs> in Key West. So those, that's kind of the, the basic concept of engagement. So what we'll do is, what you do is you just show up as you are. And then the, the second component is the presentation. And that's something that can be taught, can be learned. What I do is when I'm looking at videos that really engage people, I kind of break them down. And how did the script go? How did they keep it going on? There's plenty of books out there uh, to teach you how to properly do, how to script out. Uh, and do your presentation techniques for your YouTube videos. But that stuff that can be learned, I would never really focus on that because you could, you know, in a couple of hours, pick that presentation part up. And then the final component of the engagement mechanisms is consistency. And that, believe it or not, even though you have total control over it, oftentimes is the hardest thing you can do is to stay consistent. And what does that mean? That just means that when you say you're going to show up at 8.30 um, in the morning, do you do that? And you have to get in the habit of staying consistent. I will say in the last couple of years, social media has changed a little bit. It was like, you know what? I always have to publish my video on Wednesday at 5 p.m. because people are expecting me to show up on Wednesday at 5 p.m. It's not so much this, the case these days, especially in the world of Netflix and people watching shows when they can, but it does mean staying consistent means showing up weekly at least. Um, I, I think it's you should strive to show up you know, like through two to three to four times weekly, if at all possible, but to always be in your uh, viewers circles, always popping up with a thumbnail, popping up with a blog post, showing a story, those kinds of things. And sometimes we get blocked. We're like, I can't do this all the time. I can't keep it this going. Um, there's so many things that social media platforms do to make it easy for us. Stories is one of them keep the algorithm thinking about your content by doing a story, thinking about what you can add value to someone's life in 15 seconds. Now YouTube has YouTube shorts and I have a whole probably other video in me on those, but that's another way to be able to spend a little bit less time and actually get some good engagement out of it. And then finally, the other social media platforms. I mean, you, you know, you could always show up on, we're on LinkedIn today. We're on Facebook. Um, you, you don't have to go crazy posting content, but you just got to be consistent. You got to be there weekly. 
I would say, you know, three to four times a week. So those are the three main components of the engagement mechanisms. That is the relatability, showing up as you are authentic, doing something good for someone, and then the presentation skills, which you'll learn over time. And then finally, consistently showing up week after week, year after year, and eventually you will have it. So that's really what I wanted to talk about today as far as the five YouTube tricks that I want to teach everyone that really has to do with interest inception and really getting someone's interest with the wow, the fear or the inspiration, and then keeping their interest with the engagement mechanisms. All right, let's see. Let's see. we got some people on the, the uh, chat here. Hi everyone. Uh, it's spot. What is it? Spot life. Yeah. Spot life. Uh, Cherry from the Philippines. Hey, good to see you, Cherry. It's awesome. Um, and then we have Ash. Catch them. Hi, Ash. Or, hi, Ian. I'm Ash from the Philippines. Good to see you. Uh, and then we got Johnny Bell. Uh, it says here, hi, I'm so afraid and shy to put my face out there. Yeah, I know. It's really, really hard. But I think the first thought about it is to figure out not so much what the presentation is going to be, but how you're going to get that interest and where does that interest come from? There's a lot of suggestions out there that, you know, you go to YouTube and try to figure out what content is working before you do your own content. And I think that's really valuable. But even before that, you're going to have to figure out a way to get keep or to get people's interest. And I, I'm seeing the only way you can do that is if you do some sort of wow type content. Wow, I can't believe that happened. Fearful content. Uh, or inspirational content. Those are the things that move people that I'm seeing on that work on most of the social media platforms. And myself and my creators have been doing experiments where we'll take content from TikTok, throw it on YouTube Shorts and vice versa. And we're seeing the same type of results where people, it, it works across all platforms. These are universal concepts. So yeah, when it comes to you know being afraid to, to put your face on the screen, Forget about that for right now. <laughs> Just figure out how are you going to get someone's attention. And then second of all, if you really don't want to put your face on the screen, there's plenty of channels out there that just do voiceovers. And that's fine too. I was watching a video just recently. I, I think it's Apple Explained. And most of the time, those videos have just a voiceover and you learn a lot of good content that way. So don't worry so much about that. Focus on how you're going to get interest and then worry about your engagement mechanisms. And then we have Anthony here. Anthony, when government was tribal, we all did live for the benefit of our community. Yeah, I think that's true. That We, we all helped each other. And that's why uh, I think you should get out there and do this type of content. But I think that you just can't go out and say, listen, I really like Star Trek and I'm just going to do a Star Trek channel. No, you really have to figure out, one, is Star Trek, the content, something that works in your area, in this, in, you know, whether it's be LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, whatever. And then even then you can't, it's not enough to say, yeah, there's lots of Star Trek content. You actually have to figure out a way to get people's attention in order to get that content out there. Uh, we got Mary Me. Good morning. Good to see you too. Uh, and we also have um, Devo, the M ambivert, ambivert. It looks nice out there where you are. Yeah, it's, it's really nice. It's um, we're in uh, Key West, Florida, which I've never been to. It's an awesome place. It's it's interesting. There are no beaches here, so it's just a big circle um, and beautiful water surrounding. So we're going to do some fishing later on. Um, not today, but the uh, next couple of days. So that's going to be really, really fun. Uh, and then we got uh, Anthony Dow from Athens, Greece. Well, thank you so much for joining us from so far. That's awesome. And we also have Castle Corp. Hello from Bowser's Castle. Hey, how are you? Uh, uh, oh, look at this one. Spock's talking about, uh, I think, what Anthony was talking about. Oh, no, not Anthony. Uh, Johnny was talking about. Sage fright is easier to break than you think. Yeah, well, I, you know, I think what, what Spock is saying is, is true. I think if you focus first on you know, what is going to get the attention, what value, what, 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 uh, what you can offer people and then worry less about the other stuff, that stuff can flow in, uh, then you'll, you'll be just fine. So th those are the things that, oh yeah, we need more. And then we have evil GT here. We need more growth too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm certainly getting subscribers is really, really important over time. But I think the first thing to worry about really is how you can add value. What is the subject matter that you can add value with? And then that is what will take you through your social media. And, you know, for most of us, it's, it's a marathon. I mean, it's just something that, you know, uh, there's chosen few that get the millions and millions of subs in a year. Uh, but most of us just have to kind of go through. And I think ultimately, if you really have your perspective on this, right, in other words, you're just trying to help people with whatever the topic is or entertain people, 
then the subscribers and the follows and the likes and the views and all those things, those just come later. And I know it's easier said than done, but really check yourself. I've had to do it for me too. Lots of times when I've done content, I'm like, did I really do that for them? Or did I do it for myself trying to, you know, get some likes or get some views or, or be popular or have some, some credibility? It's really not about that. What it's really about is what you can do for other people in that you educate them, uh, or entertain them in a fun way. So that would that should be the focus, honestly. And then all the other stuff can come later. If you have ten people uh, that you have, you know, ten followers, you can help ten people. That's great, and give them some some uh, some assistance. So I think it's that's the that should be the main focus. And then we have um, Jim Jim Green here, Jim in Thunder Bay, the megalopolis of the North. <laughs> How are you doing, Jim? Good to see you today. Thanks for joining us. Um, and then we also have Tom Chan. Thanks for very valuable information from Toronto, Canada, Toronto. I'd love to see you there. I would love to visit Toronto. Uh, I think it's going to be open soon. Uh, and also I think that it would be great if some of the, you know, you, you Torontons can visit us. Uh, evidently a lot of people have been in the lockdown and so that's been pretty difficult. Um, we also have uh, mismatched sock. What is YouTube's policy on posting censored videos with links to uncensored versions on alternative platforms? So they're censored. They're, you, what is your, uncensored? I think the policy, and I, actually, I think I know the policy is they don't allow it. They don't. They allow affiliate links, but they don't want links. Uh, to any other, well, first of all, I think YouTube prefers having no links to any other platforms besides Google related uh, websites. However, they certainly do not allow in the, this is what I was reading. This is the, the I think this is, well, the terms of service have it, but also the community guidelines have it. They certainly don't allow um, anyone to post a link to a site that would be barred on YouTube's own site. So in other words, the content is something that YouTube does not allow. And that's kind of a scary area, I want to say, because while YouTube always talks about, you know, three strikes, you're out for copyright, four strikes, you're out for community guidelines, um, they also reserve the right to actually cancel your channel, pull down your content, even if uh, um, you don't have any strikes in the past, if you're posting links to other websites that have censored content on them. So it does it's not allowed. Um, we got uh, GB Ron's vlog. Hi, sir. So, so sad to hear that when I was starting to grow my YouTube channel, I encountered a lot of negativity from my friends. Well, you know what's funny about that? I, <laughs> I, I did too. You know what's funny is when you start to show up consistently and you do your presentation skills and you've captured uh, the uh, some audience members' attention, it does trigger other people. And I think at one time I was, I think I was walking down the street and someone said, Hey, how you doing? How's your, you know, I saw your YouTube channel. That's cool. Uh, and I said, Oh, thank you so much. And he said, yeah, you know, but I can't watch it anymore. I was like, Oh really? I'm like, yeah, every time I watch it, I, you know, it makes me think that I should be doing the same thing. And that really kind of brought it home to me that a lot of times when you're out there trying to make a difference, putting your face out there, risking yourself, being vulnerable, that it triggers other people. And I, all I can say, and I hope it doesn't sound callous, is that's just something you're gonna have to get used to. Um, that is just something when you when you start to lead, when you start to succeed, I, I don't know, I don't wanna put it out there that people pull you down, but people are triggered by your putting yourself out there. They're like, gosh, you know, in their head, they're like, I, I should be doing that too. So what I try to do is when I sense that, when I see someone say that, or I hear that, or I even see it in the comments is I just try to respond in a kind manner to them and say, yeah, you know what, by the way, if you ever have a moment, I'd love to show you what I do. Uh, because the more people that are doing what we're doing, actually the better, uh, the more draw, more content there is, the better content there is, the more ideas there are, the more free speech that's out there. So I, when I see other lawyers and they're like, gosh, I really want to start a LinkedIn channel. Or I want to start my podcast. Subject to how much time I have, um, I will offer them to help to, to give any advice or guidance I have uh, so that they can succeed. Most of the time when I do that, they don't actually follow through, which goes to our, our uh, lesson right here, which is consistency. <laughs> um, you got to have that consistency. But myself. But um, if you um, 
Um, but if you do encounter that, try not to get frustrated with it. Just kind of proceed through it. When you get those bad comments, when there's comments out there that you know, someone's criticizing you or whatever, just try to go forward through it. If Again, if your purpose, your, your heart purpose is solid, and that is to help people understand or to be entertained in your topic, then it, it won't hurt as much because it's, it's kind of like if you're helping an old lady across the road and someone yells at you, you're kind of like, okay, well, I mean, that guy's you know, PO'd, but I helped this old lady across the road. So, you know, that's how I deal with it. <clears throat> Let's see here. Uh, we also have Devo, the ambivert. People shine at their own times like the sun and the moon do. It will, it will take certain people longer to experience a breakthrough. That is, I think that's unbelievably true. I think that's such a great comment. It, it people, people not only will shine when when it's appropriate for them to shine, but people will come to information when it's appropriate to come to it. You certainly can help people. You can encourage people, but you can't change their conduct, and you 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 can't make them get it. Um, you you just have to kind of expose and be kind, and then hopefully at some point in time uh, they will get it. And they will be able to shine like the moon and the sun. So I think that's a really, really great uh, compliment. Uh, we also got a uh, shout out to the internet subs in this chat. Shout out to Toronto. I went to Toronto once. It was fun. <laughs> Thank you so much, Devo. Um, Anthony is talking here. He says, I think I have found a niche. I, I certified in it. I have experience from both sides of the aisle. And so far, I have my organization's OGC approval to create a channel. Just need to speak with the PAO. Okay. Well, I don't know what those acronyms are, but I'm I'm really happy that you found the niche. If you if you feel, and this happens to me all the time, if you feel like you've found the niche, and now I feel like I'm blown out. Sorry. Is that better now? Or is it just too blown out? It's too blown out, darn it. Um if you feel like you have found a niche check that feeling. In other words, um, ask friends and family if they're interested in that topic or if there's some way for you to make that topic interesting to them. So let's say you're a welder. Not everybody's interested in learning how to weld or all this, the techniques of welding, but there are certain things that you can do to bring people in to have some interest into it. A lot of times your passion will sell their interest in it, but you got to test it with family, friends, about the concept. You got to test that concept and see, is this something that they would be interested in? And then the second thing you need to do is you need to go on YouTube, on, on the different social media platforms and test that concept out. Do things like stories, do things uh, like posts, like community uh, posts and, and test out and see if you, you know how many reactions people give you to that content. Always be testing um, because sometimes the greatest idea in the world it may be, but it may be multiple versions of that idea down the road. So you need to be aware of that. It's not always, you know, some of us were lucky or something. You just strike it big right when the thought occurs to you. But others, um, you know, it takes time to to refine an idea and break it all down. So that's great that you have the, uh, the potential idea. You just got to test it out. Uh, we also got Devo shouting out to our fellow American subs. Um, Simark Tech says YouTube loves to bury your content if you're sending traffic outwards. Yeah, that's uh, true. I learned it from I think it was Mr. Beast. We were at a conference and someone asked a question of to him saying, "Hey, uh, you know, Jimmy, I, I like to put you know affiliate links in my content. Does YouTube not like you know YouTube approve of that?" And his response was, um, "Well, what do you think? YouTube's main goal." And also the social media's main goal is to keep you on the platform, keep you on that platform. So if you have links that take you off the platform, do you think YouTube likes it? And while there are no specific rules that say, you you know, certainly actually YouTube expressly allows affiliate links. I try to shy away from them whenever there's an opportunity to, to take someone to a different platform you know, platform or website, I always try to make it a Google web, so website. Like if I have a offering like a PDF or something like that, I always have people download it from Google Drive because I never want to get out of the ecosystem because I'm just trying to, you know, comply with what I think YouTube mostly wants, which is keeping people on that platform. So even though it's loud, I would, um, I would, uh, I would err on the side of not having a lot of affiliate links. Um, oh yeah, we got Simar Tech. Jealousy is something awful, but it's a reality, absolutely. And and it, you know, I want to encourage, go back to that point. 
Hold on a second. I got a plane. Oh my gosh, right above me. It's. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, it's not always uh, jealousy. It's not always jealousy. Uh, sometimes it is, but a lot of times, like I said, it's just being triggered. It's it's someone inside feeling like they're not doing, they're not uh, honoring their expectations. And as a result of that, they're down on themselves. So something you're, you're doing on the external is causing someone to have a reaction inside. So always don't assume that it's jealousy just assume that someone's being triggered and how can you help? What would you, cause I'm sure you've been triggered. I've been triggered. I've seen big stars or people that have started uh, and, and gotten very popular overnight. And, and you're like, Oh my gosh, I wish I was like them. I should be working harder. I should be posting more. Um, and then you, uh, and then you start to feel jealousy or you start to feel, you know, triggered inside. And what would, how would you like someone to respond to that? And that would be kind and say, Hey, here's how to do it. Here's how to, here's how, what, here's what I did to get to that point. So that's, uh, there. Oh, we got Edie. Hi, I'm in Florida too. Well, that's awesome. Whereabouts in Florida? Let me know in the comments. Gina's here too. Hey, Gina, good to see you. Um, all right. Now we have anonymous. Hi, Ian. Appreciate your content. Really helpful. Oh, thank you so much. Um, let's see. We also have Legendo Gary. I appreciate your working in. I feel like there should be way more people in the chat room. It's crazy. Yeah, no, it's okay. You know, it's funny. I, um, I'm i trying to get very consistent, like I advise in my, <laughs> I'm going to do it again <laughs> in my slideshow. Um, but it, I travel so much. Uh, I'm going to be, we're going to be Florida for this, this week. And then I'm going to be in Costa Rica uh, the next week. And then I'll be in Hawaii um, probably later, I don't know, not probably in later June. So while you know there's time zone issues and there's day issues you, you, while i can't exactly be on wednesdays and saturdays when i'm doing this travel uh, i have to work it in and so that's i'm just happy that you guys are here um let's see <laughs> Edie, gina's saying Edie. um oh so Edie says she's near pompano beach huh i don't know where that is <laughs> i'm gonna look it up after the live stream i'll look it up uh ignorant boxing great stuff i'm learning a lot well ignorant boxing thank you so much and again with your content i think it's awesome content just remember that you got to sell it not only to the people who like boxing but you got to sell it to the people who don't like boxing because your goal is to get a broader audience audience so again i just want to kind of repeat some of those tips that i was talking about in my title of my video First thought, before you want to ever do anything like give value or entertain people, you got to get interest. And I call it interest inception. All right. There's three different types of interest inception that work on social media platforms. There's the wow, there's pranks, there's scary moments, uh, there's get rich quick schemes. There's all these different types of content that make people go wow and that draw their attention. And it works across the board all over. Uh, we, we even went through a, a couple of those things, you know, cool new products, tech, magic, um, uh, we got stunts, something that's unfair. Um, we got, uh, you know, fraud. I wish I had that house tours are, are wow content debate behind the scenes content. And then we move on to the second type of interest inception and that's fear. Now I, I, I hope when I say fear, I'm not trying to make you, you know, feel like it's a bad thing. It's just that you have to let people know that there are some negative consequences sometimes for certain actions. So when I'm talking about copyright strikes, I'm not trying to make you scared and have nightmares, but I do want to let you know that you got to follow the rules of fair use, certainly copyright law when you're doing your social media content. And if you don't, you're going to be taken off the platform. Sorry, but that does get your attention. And then the, fin the final of the interest inception is inspiration. And that content I said is trying to pump people up but it's got to be in your face. You got to be able to deliver what that inspiration is as quickly as possible. Once you got the attention, you move on to the engagement mechanisms. We we're already talking about those uh, relatability, being authentic on camera, presentation skills, read up on how to be a good public speaker. You can learn and then consistently consistency show up consistently. Um, every show up. So that is that. Um, let's see. Spotlight says I have 105 videos on my meditation channel. I love meditation channels, by the way, but still not doing good. Patience is important. Yeah. You know, it's funny, even in, in, a, in a 
a niche like meditation, there are things you can do within these categories of wow, fear, and, and inspiration. I would say your biggest uh, selling point is inspirational content. What can you do to inspire people to meditate on a daily basis? I think the thing that's inspiring is when you, you tell people how easy it is. I recently have started a consistent practice of meditation, but it's not its not sitting down. I've got another plane coming up. Uh, it's not sitting down and, um, you know, crossing my legs and that kind of stuff. What it is, it's actually lying down and listening to meditative music on Spotify for 10 or 20 minutes a day. And what's so wonderful about it is that I have a plane right there. Is, uh, hold on one second. I'll drink, I'll drink a glass of or coffee. That is one thing I will say now being in Key West, Florida, it is such a small, it's an island, it's four miles by four miles. And so people, their planes landing all the time. So it, it can be kind of loud here. Um, but anyway, so, oh my gosh, that's so nice of you. Holy crap, what in the world just happened? Um, wow, thank you so much. Uh, Radar Boxing TV, again, we talked about boxing content. What up, sir? Can you give me some tips on how to avoid copyrights? My content is all about boxing news with some video clips, and I'm using my voice as a voiceover commentary. Uh, one love from, I think that's, is that from the Philippines? Is that the flag? I don't even know. Well, first of all, Iridar Boxing, thank you so much for this. This is the kindest thing I've ever seen. It's so, so, so wonderful. Thank you. Uh, yes, I can definitely give you some tips on how to avoid copyrights. First of all, understand that your channel is a difficult channel, uh, and that is because you're using a lot of content that's that someone else owns the copyrights to, and you've got to be careful. The general rule, of course, is that you can't use other people's content on your social media channels unless you have their permission. How do you get their permission? It can be oral. You can call them up or you can see them. You can confirm it in an email, that's what I always say, and that way you have a record of it. If you ever need to show YouTube uh, that you have permission, it's so simple, you just put it in a Google Doc file, drop that link in your description section, that way there's some sort of connection between your written permission to have that content. If you don't get permission, then there is still a way you can use the content and that's through the concept of fair use. You know, as well as I, that fair use has a couple, well, there's several components to it, but two main ones are education and news. You appear to be probably talking about commentary, news, and education. And so if you're teaching about things, if you're reporting the news, if you're giving your opinion on things, okay, and you're, you're using other people's content around that, that is legal on all of the social media platforms. The, the problem comes in is how you do it. And what I always recommend my creators do is have no longer than two to five seconds of the content, and then to add the commentary, the, the education, the news uh, reporting around that content. If, you know, the, the masters of fair use, they do it. They'll do it before the content, after the content, and during the content. The one thing to remember about fair use here, and especially when it comes to Iridar Boxing TV right here, is that you know, you don't need as much content as you think you do. One of the one of the big talks we have when my, my creator consults um, is that people say, "Hey, listen, I want to use this content. I want to put thirty seconds here. I want to put fifteen seconds there." And I and I tell them, I go, "Do you really absolutely need that much content? Most of the time, you can get your message across with much less content and." get creative. A lot of my creator clients, what they do is they have a two second clip and then they, you know, hire someone on Fiverr or Upwork to do some animation, do some drawings, uh, sketches, and then they intersperse those sketches, those animations with the live comment, with the video clip. And that gets the same message across. That is the, basically it's the same content, the same entertainment value, uh, as if you were going to do a 15 second clip. So that is the fair use um, uh, kind of spiel in about 20 seconds or so. One of the, the biggest things to remember of fair use is that you never want to replace uh, or never you want to take the content of someone else and have people tuning in for that 
specific content. So you don't want to take a boxing match and just completely live stream the, the entire boxing match. So people are tuning into your channel as opposed to the original channel that had that content. What you want to do is offer your own art around that boxing content, do that commentary around that content. And that is going to save you from getting copyright claims and copyright strikes. Thank you so much again, uh, Iridar Boxing. I really, really appreciate it. If you have more questions, please let me know down below. Now we have another super chat. Thank you so much from Reaction Riot, another reaction channel, I'm sure. Hey, Ian, I love the videos. I've been wanting to start a drum cover channel, but I don't want I don't want to deal with copyright strikes. How would you do this? Um, it's, it's a drum cover channel. Okay, so probably what you're doing is you're covering the drum solos or, or the drum parts of music. Uh, that's going to be fairly easy, I think. And the reason why I say that is even though the, the songs that you're covering obviously are copyrighted uh, and you would need uh, um, uh, multiple licenses to be able to legally use that content, I would say that drums are a pretty hard thing to uh, pick up on YouTube AI. In other words, YouTube AI is looking for taking other copyrighted songs from their library, but they're not probably looking for drum, just pure drum solos. They probably will pick up a voice, someone singing a cappella, uh, before they would ever pick up just a drum cover of a of a of a song. So I think you're probably in the clear. But I will say this: just be careful because technically you can't take you can't cover content uh, on YouTube. Um, without having a license. The, the one thing I was going to also want to say is that there is an easy way to detect whether or not your videos are going to get a claim or a copyright strike, and that is to make the video, rough cut it, don't finalize it, just rough cut it, throw that onto YouTube as unlisted and let the YouTube AI do its work. If it comes back and it checks and you got a green check mark or a green a dollar sign, then you're okay to put that content up there. Beware that I do have creators out there who have gotten the, the green uh, dollar sign for their content and later on picked up a claim, but it's a good sign that you're on the right track. So if I were you, I would try to, when you do your cover, trying to use different drums, try to completely transform the original music that you're covering. And then I would just rough cut it, unlist it, upload, and then make sure it checks out with YouTube and you should be fine. Oh, all right. We also got Doug here. Great. As always to catch Ian live. Good to see you so much. <laughs> so happy. I saw you live recently too, Doug. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. We got here, Anthony, a fun way to get over stage fright and improve public speaking skills is comedy improv improvisation class. I have taken several at the DC improv. Now I think that's a great idea too. And I've actually done some acting classes, uh, myself in Venice, California, um, and I think it's absolutely smart. Anything to get you out in front of people in an uncomfortable situation will help you uh, getting your content out there, adding value or entertaining. So yes, you know, going, you know, performing music in front of people, uh, do, doing like your, what you're going to do in your video in front of your, your family or friends, anything that makes you uncomfortable, that's what you should be leaning into so that you can get better at your content. But I will say this, and again, not a super expert, but I work with creators every day in my consults, and basically it just takes time. Everyone goes at their own pace, you know? Uh, and what's kind of nice is that it, there's almost this, this point when you're doing your content where you, you feel like, oh, I just don't, I don't, I don't give a crap. In other words, um, I don't need this particular camera. I, you know, I don't, this script is not working. It doesn't, you know, it's not the way I normally like to make my videos. You just get to this point where you're like, you know what, I'm just going to show up and I'm going to do my best. You know, and when you get to that point, you know, you're on the right track for sure. Um, so yes, I would encourage everyone to do improv classes, uh, or acting classes or public speaking classes for sure. Um, uh, let's see here. I gotta catch up. This one is from anonymous. Do videos or images get copyrighted? No audio on it. Yes, they do. Uh, YouTube's AI can. It's it's an, the most amazing computer in the world. Will go through your video images, your still images, and be able to pick those up as either a copyright claim or, you know, could be a copyright strike if there's a DMCA takedown notice. So yes, um, I will say this though that if you're trying to figure out you need to use someone else's content without their permission you're trying to figure out how to present it 
you use taking the audio off is the easiest way to not get a claim or a strike. YouTube's AI is extremely sensitive to audio and not as sensitive to video as you can imagine. So like I've used this example before, I one time had a, a scene that I wanted to borrow and I think it was a car driving by and um, I think it was from a movie or something. And so I brought in two to five seconds, I think it was three seconds. And then what I did is I pulled the audio, muted the audio and I brought in the sound effect of a car driving by and I got it from Epidemic uh, Sound uh, and put that sound effect. So the audience doesn't know the difference. They just think it's it's the image of the car driving by. They didn't remember the specific audio that went beneath it. So that's a great way to be able to use fair use and also not trigger YouTube AI. Uh, we have uh, Godfam Zeta. Hey people, literally just watch the algorithm and win the lottery, get off the stream right now. <laughs> I like that. This is his tip. So it's Godfam Zeta. Hey people, literally just watch the algorithm and win the lottery. Get off the stream right now. <laughs> well, listen, it, it could be very, it, it could be that easy too. You know, I got to tell you, there, there's another point. Uh, there's plenty of examples of people out there just doing it. Uh, they just get it. Maybe they had some training before. I was thinking about the photographer Peter McKinnon. Uh, where for I think seven years before he started his YouTube channel, he was doing uh, magic tricks and videography and all these different things that really helped him get comfortable in front of the camera before he actually started his YouTube channel. So the same is true. I think a lot of times it, it, uh, it is, um, it just, some people get lucky, some people have the experience and they have their YouTube channel and it, and it just works out. So all I can say is you just, the first step is think, what can I add? How can I add value? How can I be entertaining? And then the second step is how do I get someone's attention? Like we talked about before. Uh, and the third thing is how can I keep their attention so you can help them? Uh, let's see here. Oh, um, UFOS channel. Thank you for this video, sir. Informative, encouraging. God bless you. Well, thank you so much. I'm happy to be encouraging because I got to tell you, I want to encourage everyone to get out here and live stream. Uh, I, I want to say I have been a fool for not doing it more. And I've now I have a, a unique commitment to it. And that's why I, I uh, emphasize this consistency, um, because I think it's a great way to meet people and be able to real time help people. You know, one of the things I do is I do these online consults. And if you ever want to do a consult with me, just go to iancorzine.com and you can go to the upper right hand corner and click book and you can spend some time with me. We can go through your channel, do some copyright work. Um, analyze, maybe there's a brand deal that's coming up for you, you can check out. So um, when I do that though, it's it's um, spending, you know, 45 minutes, sometimes longer with uh, creators on consults and I don't get a chance to spend time with you guys. And so the, what's so wonderful about these live streams is that you can ask these questions, I can hopefully give you some positive answers and do it in much less time than, you know, a whole 45 minutes, so that's awesome. Uh, let's see, da, 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 da. okay, we have another question from, uh, Anthony Dower, does it have to be an artist rendering or can we use software that turns a copyrighted photograph into a comic or sketch? That's a really good question. Um, no, it does not have to be a rendering of another artist. And yes, you could do that. I will say that what ends up happening if you do use that kind of software is you're converting, it's technically a violation of copyright law uh, because you're, you're converting someone else's content uh, based upon a computer program uh, and it's the original content just being transformed. So it's not uh, a, a creative endeavor for you. It's a computer endeavor. But I will say this, for, for terms of YouTube AI, it's probably not going to be picked up. And there's subtle, there's subtle modifications you can do around these computer programs that change the, the image. What you can do is you can add fair use uh, concepts. So let's say you, you uh, animate uh, superhero, but then you do commentary about the superhero Iron Man and you talk about him before, after, and during the clip. That's a way to get at fair use. Um, we have Zany Zara. We have been losing views and subscribers since the COPPA legislation kicked in. How can we get it back, get back on track? Yeah, geez. Well, I think the, the key here, and I never want to encourage people to to, to not do what they love, but I think is is getting your content on different platforms and maybe getting behind a paywall we're starting to see this all over the place. People are starting to say, you know what? I would rather have more control over my content. And so what I'm gonna start doing is having you come to my website and pay $1.99 a month or something for my content. And then that way you have a broader area, a broader um, 
palette for your content and you can better control it. And then there's a, a quid pro quo. You're giving value, entertainment value um, or, or educational value. And then someone is paying you for your time. So that's what I'm seeing out there. A lot of people, people are moving to Rumble, uh, moving to other social media platforms. Your content is great. It just that a lot of the platforms now for a variety of reasons, the laws, the politics, whatever, are condensing the amount of content that's available, squeezing out mid-size to, uh, to smaller creators and putting more mainstream type content on the platform. You can see it right now. If you go into the Explorer tab on, on YouTube, whether it be mobile or desktop, you'll see a lot of the mainstream content pushed right to the top, a lot of the smaller content just sprinkled in. So there isn't a way, I think, on YouTube to really change the tide when it comes to children's content. I think you gotta go behind a paywall. You gotta build that email list, like Roberto will always tell you. <laughs> um, and then you need to maybe visit some other platforms uh, for that content. And there's tons of them out there. One thing I was gonna mention, I really love blockchain technology. We talk about a lot on the channel, NFTs and crypto and those types of things. That is the future. I think there's a, an app called Status, which you can get on the iPhone and the Android, and it's built on the blockchain. And it's basically like a social media platform. It's There's messaging, there's groups, uh, there's the ability to have videos and images and things like that. So think outside of the box. Think about you know decentralized technology to give your content a voice. So I would highly recommend you, exam you look into the blockchain type uh, apps that are new and just start there too. You know, obviously go to the other platforms that are more mainstream, but also focus on some of the blockchains because what's great about blockchain, it's decentralized. So uh, that's good. Uh, that means that hopefully no one government has control over the content. Certainly not the FTC. Um, we have here, Legendo Gary. My channel consists of gaming, streaming, skits, and investing. Those are my main hobbies. Is this okay or do I need to niche down even more? Well, I think I'm of the opinion that you can never niche down too small. <laughs> yeah, and th this is a really a frequent uh, question we talk about in, in consults about where is my niche? And I think that you can't go wrong having a super small niche and then building on there. So, you know, if you are, I saw Roger, thank you, good to see you, Roger. Roger's here on the, on the um, live stream. Uh, Roger does plumbing type content, but you know what, uh, if, if you were into plumbing like Roger was, you could do, you could reduce it down. You'd only do uh, landscaping plumbing. You only do commercial plumbing. You only do toilets. You only do tile in bathrooms and you could reduce it down that small. And I think what's great about that is that you get this small viable audience that likes your content that likes content about, you know, bathroom uh, tiles. And then you expand as you get a hundred subscribers that are following you because of your plumbing tile um, videos, then you expand and then you move on to faucets. That's kind of the way to think about it. I, I know we all have varied interests. I know that I do. And sometimes I get so frustrated because I'm interested in so many other things besides the law. I'm interested in attention hacking. I'm interested in uh, music, live music. We actually saw it yesterday for the first time in you know, over a year. Um, I'm interested in so many different things, but really I understand that that I can't I can't keep an audience, I can't get the attention of audience if I'm constantly talking about all these different subjects. I have to narrow it down. So I do think you're better served if you um, uh, narrow down your content, keep a very, very small small niche, and then build out from there. That's probably what you're the, the best thing you can do. Uh, thank you so much, Roger, for joining us. We got Hell Rio, the the grow as YouTuber should be or, or the growth as YouTuber should be organic, especially if you show your persona or try to create a character. People can, uh, yeah, that's that is absolutely the truest thing I've heard. Um, certainly organic. You know, back in the old days, people would pay for subscribers or views. Such a waste of time. Um, anything that you can do, you know, even it sounds crazy to say this, but even collaborations, you know, it used to be like, oh my gosh, you know, if I just got a, uh, you know, a, I'm doing my video game live streaming and I did it with PewDiePie, uh, man, I would get a million subscribers overnight. Well, you may, you actually may, but those subscribers you don't want because those are the subscribers that are there for PewDiePie. And if you can't deliver his type of content, they're not gonna stay. So there's real no, there, there is no shortcuts in life, as you know. Um, there's no shortcuts in life and there's no shortcuts on YouTube or the social media platforms. 
you the only type of audience you want is an engaged audience and you never can get angry with people for not watching your videos it's your fault if they're not watching it's your fault if they're not engaged um so you really really need to focus on getting that engaged audience and how you do that is you start out small and you and they do exactly what i talked about <laughs> put the put the slides back up here you um let's see if i put this like this you start at, first of all, you figure out a way that you can add um, value or entertain. Then you understand that your first job is to get attention. And those are three ways. You can do wow type content. You can do fear-based content. You can do inspirational content. Once you figured out something that will get someone else's attention, you know, someone that you don't know is attention, then you move on to engagement mechanisms. And like I've talked about before, relatability, being authentic, uh, just showing up, trying to be as relaxed as possible and not worrying about how you appear and just kind of doing what, what is you, what's truly you, and then learn your presentation skills. We talked about this before, going to an improv class, uh, take an acting class, do public speaking classes, practice in front of your friends. Those kind of things will get you better on camera. And then consistency. When you say you're going to show up on Wednesday at 8.30 a.m., you show up on Wednesday at 8.30 a.m. When you say you're going to be on, you know, going to do two videos a week, you do two videos a week. And if you're going on vacation and you don't have the ability to do videos, then you got to batch. You got to make four videos so that you can, you know, have the content when you're away. Those are the things you need to do to succeed on YouTube. It's it just, it's absolutely that simple. Um, so let's just make sure I got this uh, one. Um, so yes. So I'm going to go back to what Hell Rio says. It is, you know, to, to grow on YouTube or any of the social media platforms, it's got to be organic. Um, and by the way, I also work with a lot of creators who just get these amazing deals. <laughs> I mean, so many thousands of dollars. It's absolutely amazing. But what's interesting is the bigger value deals are not, don't correspond to the amount of subscribers. So just because you have a million subscribers, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get that $50,000 deal. There's plenty of people out there who are, you know, sub 20,000, uh, sub 50,000, sub 100,000 uh, and are getting major deals. And the reason why is that they have 100,000 subscribers, but in 24 hours, they have, you know, 35,000 views consistently. The, the uh, brands out there want micro influencers. They want people that have engagement. They're going all across the board now trying to find people to, to, uh, to sponsor and they're looking for you. So what does that mean? Your job is to get that real organic engagement and you, you will get those deals and then I can help you write the contract for those deals. <laughs> um, all right. Thank you, Ian, for answering question. You have a great, you have great patience. Oh, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> And then Raj is not quite that easy. <laughs> um, all right. We also have Janet here. I randomly sing about everything, not very well. Most of it is made up, but often I'm using melodies from songs. Is this a problem? It's not, it's not a problem, but I, I got to tell you, be careful on YouTube. Uh, the AI is so sophisticated that if you do sing, you hum. There's been instances of people humming a song and YouTube can pick that up and, and call it a claim. So you just got to be careful. Uh, vary the melody a lot. <laughs> Change the lyrics. Um, do you think maybe don't not sing the whole song in one fell swoop, just sing little parts? That's a way to get around it. It's, it's absolutely crazy. Like in real life, you could never get a copyright infringement lawsuit uh, or you could never be sued for copyright infringement if you're merely humming a melody as you're walking down the, the boulevard. Um, but in YouTube world, you actually could. So uh, be careful with that. Uh, oh, here we go. Uh, Devo says, what app do you use to make your thumbnails? I don't use an app. What I do is I, I started out making my own thumbnails and I realized that I am the worst at Photoshop. I do not, it is not intuitive to me. I just can't figure it out. I've, I'm gonna I'm keep working, I'm, keep, I'm never gonna give up. But I realized that I needed to farm that out. So I have a, a graphic designer who does my thumbnails and um, I love him, he's the best. His name is Dave and he really helps me out. So that's, that's who I have that done by. I really realize, I think that when we talk about getting someone's interest, I was doing my, an experiment with myself and my daughters. We were looking at uh, Netflix thumbnails, you know, you're scrolling through and you look at those thumbnails and that is the first thing you see when you're, when you're thinking about audience inception, the first thing you see is that picture. So what I've thought I've seen very common is how you do it is you have to have some sort of emotional 
reaction on the thumbnail. And I think what works best is when you have a, a counterintuitive motion. So let's say you're doing a house tour, let's say, and maybe what you have is you have a kind of a background of the house and then you have the price and let's say the price is $4 million. So you have it in all big, you know, bolded 4 million. But then the thumbnail image of the, the person image is maybe a person sad, they're crying. Um, that's counterintuitive. This big fancy house for $4 million and then you see someone crying. That makes you inquisitive. You're like, well, I wonder what's going on there. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna watch this video to see what's happening. So I think emotion on your thumbnail and I think oftentimes if it's counterintuitive, that's going to get people's attention because what they're looking at is they want to uncover surprises. <laughs> they want to know, they want to be surprised. And so when you're doing things like that, when there's a counterintuitive motion on your thumbnails, people are like, they don't know what's going on. They want to question it. They want to learn the surprise. So that's, that's what I uh, would advise. Um, let's see. We also have Sim Architect. The question is always how transform must the content be to be considered new and not a copy? Absolutely. That's exactly right. It's got to be substantially transformed. And again, I think the first step is figuring out how you can use content that you don't own um, uh, uh, legally. But before you do that, I think, is there any way you can convey the ideas that you want to convey without using that content? I mean, I would, I would almost start if I'm, if I'm doing a review channel, I would almost start with the kind of the fun goals. I'm going to do this review channel and I'm not going to use a single image or video clip or audio clip about what I'm talking about. And there are YouTube channels out there that are doing that. I was thinking about camera conspiracies with Casey Stern. There are off, he does a camera review, so he'll, he'll review a camera. But what's so funny about it is that most of the time he doesn't have the camera and he doesn't show images of the camera he's reviewing on his uh, videos. He just talks about it. And I got to tell you, it's super engaging. It's probably my favorite YouTube channel out there. And he's not using those images. You can do the same thing. We, we kind of all think, oh my gosh, we got to have these cool B-roll and slow motion footage and all these things out there to, to describe it. And that's how the audience will be engaged. Not necessarily. You would be surprised if you can do a good four minute, five minute talk on a product or some idea, you can actually do it without those images. So just experiment with yourself. Next video, try to figure out how can I do this content I want to do without using borrowed content. And then what's happened? Then what happens is over time you can sprinkle it in uh, once you feel comfortable with what you're doing. But before then, that's the best way not to get a copyright claim or a copyright strike for sure. Uh, we got crazy tech and puppets. Hi, Ian. First time I've seen you live. Great. Well, that's so nice of you, Crazy Tech. I really, really appreciate it. I like your uh, uh, avatar image too. That's cool. Um, yeah. Um, let's see right here. We got uh, the SimArchitect. Plus, if you have a paywall, nobody will be checking what you have inside because it's not accessible to the public and you just need a fraction of the audience to make the same money. Mm -hmm. Well, how you do that is you focus on uh, interest inception. What can you do to get someone's interest, pull them out of this world, and then what you can do is incentivize it too. Uh, I've done so many different, uh, what I call opt-ins, which are little pamphlets, like newsletter type things, where it explains copyright rules, where it explains community guidelines, where it explains social media platform, um, um, you know, guidelines or, or rules. And then I give them out for free in exchange for an email. And then that email uh, address goes into my list. And then I do a, a weekly newsletter. By the way, if you'd like to get my weekly news, if you'd like to get my weekly newsletter, uh, go to iancorsign.com and there's a little sign up box right when you pop in there, and I do a weekly uh, letter which talks about my videos, uh, do my blog posts, um, all sorts of interesting ideas that I have about social media and how to succeed on it uh, in this newsletter. So if you want to join the list, please do go to iancorsign.com. Uh, but that's the way you do it. You do it through interest inception, and then you do it through offering things to people that they can use. Uh, I have a copyright book that I wrote. I give it away for free, and then that will allow people to uh, to join the list, and then I can deliver more good content to them. So, oh, wow, thank you. Anthony, super sticker. Thank you so much, Anthony. That means so much to me. I appreciate it. Awesome. And then we have Cy Pro Official. He's listening. Thank you for listening. Um, and let's see. That's a granny wig. Yep. <laughs> I see that there. Um, unboxing still a thing on YouTube. Absolutely. Unboxing is still a thing on YouTube. I still don't understand it. People love it. 
do an unboxing without the unbox. <laughs> That's what I advise. Guys, I have got to go because it's, uh, we're going to go and, and hopefully go out in the water today. I'm really excited about that. Um, but I wanted to say thank you so much for joining me today. If you have questions, if you ever want to just meet up and talk about this stuff, go to iancorzine.com. You can schedule some time on my calendar by going to the upper right-hand corner, clicking on book now, uh, and get on my calendar. I'd love to have it. Otherwise, you can also just get you know uh, a little bit from me every week when I send out my weekly newsletter email. Uh, by joining the list, just going to iancorzine.com, enter in your email uh, list or email ad address and name, and I will get that newsletter to you as soon as possible. And I just want to say thank you so much. I'm going to be coming back uh, for a live on Tuesday from Florida again, and I hope to see you all there.